follow. The idea is also that after presentation, everybody leaves except uh, the jury members. There's a video, so the jury members, which is uh, Gilt, who was uh, sick today, and then Jose Covarco, who will receive the video, or they both will receive the video, and maybe ask questions afterwards. Um, and that's it. After um, the presentation, you might have some questions or whatever you want. And that's the first half. But it's up to you now. Thank you. Uh, first off, welcome everyone, in particular the members of my uh, doctoral jury. Uh, thank you for attending my presentation today on this uh, well, relatively early hour. Um, so the title of my PhD thesis is Heuristic Algorithms for Payment Models and Project Scheduling. Now before going into detail, let's first uh, take a look at the title. I'll start from the back. So my thesis is on project scheduling, which means that if you take a look at the typical dynamic scheduling triangle, the focus of my research is very much here in the baseline in the scheduling part and assumes a deterministic uh, environment. So there is no talk about schedule risk analysis, no talk about project control, baseline scheduling, that's it. Now second, payment models, which means that I will talk about cash flows and I will talk about net present value. Now one of the major ideas is how can both be linked? Well, to transform a set of activity cash flows to the net present value of the project, we're going to use a discount rate and obviously the net present value will depend on your actual activity finish times. One of the major questions that I will answer in my research is what about the timing and size of cash flows and what is the impact of both on uh, the net present value and overall as part of these payment models. Uh, note that the thesis is written from the contract point of view. So um, the only party that I consider is the party responsible for executing and as such also scheduling uh, the project. And finally, heuristic algorithms, which means that my uh, research focuses very much on local searches and schedulers as part of uh, overarching meta-heuristic frameworks. And why are these local searches and uh, problem-specific schedulers important? Well, that's due to the non-regularity of the net present value objective, which means that um, it will often be beneficial to delay certain activities or certain subsets of activities. The slide gives an overview of my different paper chapters, and in the following uh, 25 minutes, I will go into detail um, on each of these. So let's get right into it. First is this one, and the focus in my first paper very much the ground layer of my overall PhD research is on the timing of cash inflows. What does this mean? It means that we are going to assume that the size of the cash flows is known. Namely, we know that each activity either has a positive or a negative net cash flow, which is shown here. But the question now is, when are we going to schedule this activity? At what point in time will these cash flows be received? in case it are cash inflows, or at what point in time do they have to be paid? And we have to distinguish between, between two cases, namely, if an activity has a positive cash flow, then assuming that we only would need to schedule this single activity, it will always make sense to schedule the activity as soon as possible, because delaying it will um, decrease the net present value, whereas for an activity with a negative cash flow, the opposite applies. Now, what the real interesting part about this research is, is that the moment you have to consider several sets of activities, then the question becomes, what am I going to do now? Am I going to schedule this subset of, say, five activities as late as possible, as early as possible? And in order to cope with this, I designed this scheduler. A scheduler which in fact consists three large parts. So we have the initial schedule, which simply schedules all activities at their earliest start time, subject to renewable resource constraints. Um, the project or the problem is also subject to a, a tight deadline, which means we have to ensure that our project can actually be scheduled within that deadline. But the most important part 
is the one marked in green, and that's the net present value improvement method, which actually consists of two large parts, two sets of activity move rules, and the first set of these rules focuses on the project network. Say we want to delay a certain activity, which will have a net present, uh, sorry, a negative cash flow in this case. How are we going to determine whether this activity stays at its current finish time or whether it is delayed? To do so, we take a look at the successors in the project network and predecessors of these successors along with successors of these successors. So we actually construct um, a subtree, if you will, of the entire project network then take a look at the combined or cumulative net present value of this subset and determine whether it should be delayed or not. A similar logic applies for the second set of rules, with the major difference that we are now not going to consider the project network, but the actual schedule under consideration. What's important here is that activities added to this subset may be precedence related, but they don't have to be, where in this case, the activities included in the subset were always precedence related. And this scheduler, which I show here, obviously has to be implemented in some part, in some sort of meta heuristic. And for that part, I chose the genetic algorithm. Um, and important to note is that I also implemented um, the topological ordering of uh, the Bellis et al., which actually updates your activity lists. Uh, once uh, a schedule has been constructed to show some very um, brief, briefly show some results we see two tables so I've compared my results with the two best known uh, results from literature um, and I've compared them on the basis of the percentage average deviation from an upper bound which means that the lower the deviation the better your results are and I've also included the percentage of instances for which uh, my method actually found uh, the best results uh, to date. Now on to the next chapter. Um, so far I've been mainly, or I have only been talking about uh, the timing of cash flows. But what if you were to consider the size as well? Um, so what do I mean in this case? Let's assume that instead of a pre-assigned cash flow to each activity, we have only cash outflows assigned to each activity, in essence only costs. What about the cash inflows? Well, the cash inflows, this time the timing of these inflows is determined in advance. For instance, uh, progress payments, which means that, for example, after 5, 10, 15 weeks and so on, you will receive cash inflows based on the work done since the previous payment. But again, the question now arises, how am I going to schedule my activities? How am I going to try and cope with this, this difference compared to the previous chapter? And before going into detail about how I handle this, you have to consider these two graphs. Recall from earlier in the previous chapter that the net present value curve of each activity was either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, um, depending on whether the activity had a negative or positive cash flow, but in case we work with payment times which are determined in advance, so in this case for instance 5 and 10, we get this typical sorting pattern, which means that for instance for this activity, the optimal finish time if you will, would be to schedule it at time 5, assuming that um, there are no other activities which have to be scheduled important to show is that it will never be beneficial to schedule it at any later time, not even at the second uh, peak in the curve, because I'm not entirely sure whether it's clear, because the peak is in fact a bit lower than the earlier one. Now, this curve assumes fixed time intervals. Let's now assume that the time intervals are not fixed, that for instance our first interval goes all the way from 0 to 9, and the second payment interval is only 9 to 11, then in this case, it will be best to try to schedule this activity here, and it will never pay off to stop trying to delay your activity here, but delaying it further does not make any sense, but obviously take into account that this is very simple, and it only applies to the, to the single activity case. The moment 
you actually are going to consider sets of activities, you have to look at their combined net present value again. This figure shows that it's actually an extension from the previous one. It again consists of several parts. What's important here is, and I didn't mention it before, is that I'm going to apply this reasoning in both a single and a multi-mode context, which means that I also need some sort of mode improvement. Because if I start, in this case, with both a, an activity list and a mode list, then the question becomes, is this mode list non-renewable resource feasible? If it is, okay, fine, no problem. But if it's not, we have to try and uh, mediate this, try and reduce this excess of resource requests. Um, and second, that's exactly the same as in the previous figure. We are again going to try and construct an initial deadline renewable resource feasible schedule. And at the end, we are going to apply again activity move rules. Now, what's the difference when compared to the previous chapter? Is that both types of rules, in general, the concepts still apply, but of course we're now going to consider these typical sawtooth patterns instead of a strictly decreasing or increasing curve. We also have included a um, penalty function with respect to the non-renewable resource feasibility. And obviously, as I stressed earlier, you also need some kind of mode improvement. Um, very briefly, some results. Um, so I've tested <coughs> this on three data sets from literature. And what the table shows is the percentage of average improvement when applying the activity mode rules compared to when you wouldn't apply them. And what you see is here for both the progress payments, so the regular intervals, and for the payment at event occurrences, irregular intervals, what the improvement actually is. Um, also an important result from this chapter is that um, is the impact of the order strength, namely that the order strength has a profoundly negative effect on your net present value. Why is this? Well, because in the payment model that I discussed in the earlier chapter, so the strictly decreasing or increasing curves, and that's not very good, is it? Let's hope it lasts another 20 minutes. Uh, that's referring to the projector, by the way. Um, why is this? Because it means that you can schedule less activities in parallel, which means that instead of scheduling each individual activity around its own preferred finish time, you're going to schedule them more in a serial manner, which means that some cash inflows may be received later, and some cash outflows, which you would prefer to delay considerably, may have to be paid earlier. And the payment models discussed in this chapter, a similar logic applies, but this time simply whether an activity is scheduled closer to a payment time or further away from. Now, what if I were to consider both timing and size of cash flows together? Um, I'm again going to discuss three different types of payment models which have different underlying assumptions. For the cash flows, I'm again going to assume, um, well, I'm not going to take it explicitly into account, meaning that I'm going to make an assumption with respect to the cash outflows. In this case, unlike in the previous chapters, I will assume that these occur during the activity in a stepwise manner. And I will apply these payment models to this three time cost trade up problem. Now, to illustrate how these three payment models <coughs> work, consider this very simple two activity uh, example. Each activity has a duration, a cost, and a created value. Now, this created value, it's important to consider is actually the value which you are going to create for the client of your project by scheduling this activity. Typically, based on compensation proportion, in this case, assume 0 0.8, um, you will actually determine what, from your point of view, so the contractor point of view, are the actual cash inflows, which in this case means that I, as the contractor, will at a certain point, or at different points in time, receive for this activity not 200, but rather 160. Um, important remark here is what does the progression <coughs> in terms of costs for the contractor, but also in terms of creating value for the client look like? 
there are these typical um, stepwise um, patterns, if you wish. Um, and what's important to know, to highlight is the distinction between both, namely that for the costs, I'm going to assume that if an activity were to start at time zero, that we are going to immediately incur costs because after all, we need to be able to start executing the activity. Whereas in terms of created value, the value will only be created at the end of each time unit. So again, assume we start executing this activity at time zero. It means that the first value will only be considered actually created at time one. Now, actually, in order to determine the net present value of this project, we first have to determine when are we going to receive our payments. If, for instance, in this case, we assume that we have two payments, and we have a project deadline of 10, then we will actually receive payments, or we will determine this simply by dividing our deadline by the number of payments, so 10 divided by 2, which will be 5, and the resulting net present value is uh, 75.8. This is still relatively simple. For those of you uh, who are paying attention in a lot of detail, you will notice that this is in fact exactly the same as the progress payments which I discussed earlier. Um, what about more complex things, like assume the progress-based payment pattern in which um, our, cash, our, sorry, our payment times are determined based on the progress of the project in terms of total created value. In order to determine the payment times, we're going to consider the total created value, which is 200 plus 90, and again divided by the number of payments, which results in a threshold value of 145. Now, how are we going to derive the payment times from this? Well, assume that we have scheduled both activities. We have a deadline of 10, so it's very simple. This activity will finish at time four, and this one at time 10. What we know is, based on such a graph, that for this activity, at time zero, we will have a creative value of zero, at time one, 50, at time two, 100, at time three, 150. And this 150 will exceed the threshold of 145, and as such, our first payment will occur at time three. And given the very simple nature of the project, or of the example, the second payment will again occur at time 10 resulting net present value is shown. Now the third payment model that I am going to discuss is the expense-based expense payment pattern. In this case, we're going to determine uh, the payment times based on the total cost curves. Again, the same logic applies, but this time we're going to um, determine this based on our costs. So at time four, when this activity is finished, we will have incurred a total cost of 30, but that's not sufficient to allow for a payment. So we will have to wait until time six. And what you see is that due to these different payment times, that in this example, progress-based pay payment pattern leads to the best results, but this is not necessarily generalizable. It's simply to show how the three different payment models uh, can react. Again, a uh, rather complex graph on how my schedule works. What's important to note here is first off this. We're going to use either a finish time list or a select list representation. Our finish time list representation assumes that your list, which you are going to use as part of your meta heuristic, will simply contain the finish times of individual activities. And this is also something which is quite commonly used in literature. What's important is that they never discuss this they never discuss the feasibility. They simply say from how, okay, we have a finish time list or an event list, um, however you want to call it, but they never determine whether it is feasible or not. Assume that you have, again, the two activities from earlier, you have now a deadline of 15. Assume that you would say that my second activity, which takes six time units, has to finish at time seven, but based on the duration of uh, four, guess four of the first activity, this is not possible. But in literature, they do not discuss a correction mechanism for this. This is actually what I've discussed in this part of the scheduler. And the second part of the scheduler focuses on a new type of representation, namely a select list representation, in which for each activity, a value is included between zero and one. And this value will determine 
the order in which you will schedule the activities and also the amount of slack of each activity which you will consume. Uh, some results, so in this table I've compared um, a simulated annealing algorithm from literature which uses a finish time list representation with my own genetic algorithm with the finish time representation and with my own genetic algorithm with a slack list representation. And the numbers in the table are the average net present value. So what you can see is that not only does my genetic algorithm perform considerably better than the simulated annealing algorithm, but also that the slack list representation leads to even better results than simply using a finish time list representation. Um, and what I've also investigated is what is the impact of this compensation proportion and of our deadline on the types of modes which you will select. And what I found is that in case your compensation proportion is large, you will typically prefer short modes. Why is this? Because due to the very large cash inflows, you will want to receive them as quickly as possible and it will not matter that much whether this means or if this means that you have to select shorter modes which will unfortunately increase your costs but due to the compensation proportion which is large this will not really matter because you will uh, receive your much larger cash inflows a lot earlier. Reverse logic applies in case you have a small compensation proportion and a very large deadline. In this case, you will prefer the longer modes, simply in order to focus a lot more on cost reduction. What's interesting is that in case you have a small deadline, which means that you will be forced, if you want to meet this deadline, to select very short modes, um, that it's very difficult to determine or to uniformly say whether I should go for longer or shorter modes, because you have the reverse effect from the compensation proportion. Based on this parameter, you would again prefer longer uh, modes. But in this case, it's a very specific case of the combination of small compensation proportion, small deadline. It's not very clear what types of modes should be uh, selected. Now, obviously, what I've done so far in this chapter is relatively simple. This could still be um, extended by again, introducing different types of local searches. What's important is also that the typical uh, standardized random T or topological ordering representation, very much known in the RCPSP context, that I haven't discussed this, so maybe it is worthwhile to also make this comparison. On to the next chapter. Next chapter, we're going to um, take a step back from the timing and size of cash inflows and assume that they occur finish time of each activity, we're going to go more into detail on how are the R cash outflows managed and what is the impact if you were to include a capital availability in your project, namely saying that um, my project for instance starts with 100,000 euros of capital and this capital will decrease based on cash outflows and increase again based on cash inflows, but typically you can assume that there is some kind of time lag typically based on your activity durations between these outflows and inflows and then the question becomes how am I going to manage this? I will again illustrate this with a very simple example. Um, so what is shown here is the duration for each activity, the renewable resource demand, the outflow and the inflow of cash. And what I've shown here is on the left hand side the optimal schedule for the RCPS PDC, so assume you do not consider capital. Um, what you can see is that the line in bold, which marks the capital, actually becomes negative at these time units. And on the right hand side of the slide, you see what the schedule, the optimal schedule would look like if you actually were to take this bold line into account. And what's important here is that this activity too is actually advanced. Why? Because based on the available capital, otherwise activity 5 can never be started. And as part of a general model, I've chosen to select these three models to actually consider in more detail. So model 1 and 3 are two extreme cases. In the first case, cash outflows occur at the start of the activity, cash inflows at the end. We really have our entire duration um, in which there is a, yeah, a decrease in the capital. 
availability, whereas model three, we assume that both cash flows occur at the end of the activity. And in model two, um, we consider some middle ground. Again, I've implemented this as part of a figure which should be somewhat familiar to you by now. Um, I'll immediately go to results. Uh, what you see is that the capital feasibility without the capital improvement method is actually quite low for models one and two, but that it increases considerably um, given the application of uh, the proposed scheduler. Um, from a more managerial point of view, um, I've analyzed the impact of the order strain, so the network structure, the resource constraints, so the renewable resources, and of the capital constraints, the initial capital made available in the project, in more detail. What you see is that, for instance, in the case of order strain, if I were a contractor, if you were a contractor, it would be preferable <coughs> to go for more parallel projects, because not only will your capital feasibility be higher, given a low value, but also your net present value will be higher, whereas the impact of resource constraints requires you to make a trade-off, because on the one hand, in terms of capital feasibility, you can see that a high resource constraint actually makes it easier to obtain a capital feasible project, whereas it will considerably decrease your net present value on the other hand. So the question then becomes, um, how do I set my resource uh, availabilities in a, in a good manner? What is my focus? Is it very much on making sure that the project is capital feasible, or am I really going to try and optimize uh, the net present value? This effect is also shown um, with respect to or the combination of order strength and resource constraintness in more detail in these two graphs. So this shows the impact on the capital feasibility and this on the average net present value. And what you see is that, in fact, uh, low order strength and high resource constraints make it easy to ensure that your project is capital feasible, but that typically you will not have that good of a net present value for your project. Whereas if you actually increase the order strength, uh, not only will your feasibility decrease, but so will your net present value. But what's important here to note is that the lowest value in this three-dimensional graph can, in terms of average net present value, can be found for a high resource constraint and a high order strength, whereas the lowest value in terms of capital feasibility can in fact be found on this side, so again, a high order strength for the low resource constraint. The final chapter of my PhD, um, I've already alluded to briefly. Um, I'm very much going to take a look at the resource availabilities and how they should be set um, and what the impact is of setting these in one way or another on your um, net present value. So how many costs should you be willing to incur uh, for these renewable resources? aside for the members of my jury, as you have undoubtedly noticed, this graph was not in the chapter. Um, the graph in chapter 6 was in fact the graph of the second chapter. Yeah, I see girls smiling. You undoubtedly noticed this. So this is the graph that should have been there. Now it's not that different. What's different is this. And that we introduce a method to reduce the resource availability. Um, and that based on some parameter gamma determined by our metabristic, we are going to choose to either first focus on reducing these costs of our resources or first on optimizing the net present value. And this is also shown by a detailed experiment um, on this slide. So on this axis we have, are we going to apply on average the resource reduction method first, so this is the black graph, it's actually um, the average value of gamma, gamma. so in this case 40% means that of all uh, our schedules generated, in 40% of these cases we will first do a resource reduction, but in 60% of these cases we will prefer to first do net present value improvement method. Um, and the right axis 
right vertical axis shows the average net present value, and that's the least curve. What's important here, uh, you can see as, this is actually the basic scenario, is if we were to increase our resource usage costs considerably, so this is not simply a cost of one and a cost, well, it's actually a multiplication factor. Right? So this thing basically says these are the basic costs, and here they're multiplied by 10. What you see is that your net present value decreases considerably, but that actually you're only going to do the resource reduction method in 50% of the cases, which is a bit odd because we would expect, given this large impact of the resource costs, that the greater focus of our scheduler should in fact be on optimizing this resource usage. But as it turns out, the focus should in general still be a bit more on the net present value improvement rather than on uh, reducing these resource costs. I'm nearly finished just to conclusions. Um, I've talked about meta heuristics, schedulers, and net present value optimization. I've also talked about how are we going to um, determine the optimal timing and size of cash flows, mainly of cash inflows. But on the other hand, I've also discussed um, the management of cash outflows from a capital management point of view. And I've also taken the resource availability into account. Now some future research, excuse me, could focus on very much combining the modeling of these cash in and outflows and really considering the entire uh, cash perspective for a project manager as a whole. But also you could consider your negotiation processes with both the client and on the one hand of your supply chain, if you will, and with your subcontractor on the other hand, because I stressed earlier that the focus of my PhD was very much the contractor point of view. You can imagine that it would also be interesting to construct some kind of overall net present value optimization model for your, <coughs> again, due to the lack of a better word, for your entire supply chain, going from client, contractor to subcontractor, maybe even sub subcontractor. Um, so that's all I had to say. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Okay, now, uh, thank you. Um, before you leave,